We know that over the last several months since October 7th, it has been necessary for our, us to turn our attention to the defense of our shared values, of our eternal values. But before we discuss what happened on October the 7th, we must discuss how, what the events were that led to it. We know that Israel had just completed in the recent years previously thought to be impossible diplomatic breakthroughs through the Abraham Accord. These accords saw Israelis join hands with Emiratis and Bahrainis and Sudan, the people of Sudan, to forge peace arrangements. And the widespread speculation was that Saudi Arabia was next. Could you imagine what a breakthrough for peace it would have been if the Jewish state had successfully concluded an accord for peace and recognition with the homeland of Mecca and Medina. This would have charted in a new era of peace and friendship among the Abrahamic peoples, all of the Abrahamic peoples. And it was this hope that most terrified the terrorists who carried out their attack on October 7th. And more importantly, the state sponsors who orchestrated it all out of Tehran. They worried that their mission to destroy the Jewish people and Israel would be mortally wounded. Their mission would be impossible if Muslims and Jews were able to unite together in peace. What's worse, what scared them even more was the possibility that the Palestinians have a hopeful future, a vested interest in their, the days that, ahead of them that would distract them from this endless conflict with Israel. You see, the Palestinians have a tremendous opportunity to build a peaceful and prosperous future. I mean, we see the poverty and suffering in Gaza, and we think, what could people possibly have been hopeful about? Well, the answer is plenty. It is a well-situated piece of geography right next to the Mediterranean. Look at the countries in the Gulf, how much prosperity an opportunity that they have been able to build for their people. Not only that, effectively speaking, Hamas had total independence to run Gaza after the Israeli government unilaterally withdrew in a painful decision whereby the, deci the government of Israel literally arrested its own people and dragged them out of the Gaza Strip and back to the Israel proper, a deeply controversial decision that effectively meant Gaza was going to be governed by the government in that land. So when they say end the occupation, in Gaza the only occupier was Iran. Iran was occupying Gaza through its intermediary, Hamas. Iran was remote controlling Hamas and ensuring that the Palestinian people would not be able to build a brighter future as long as Israel was next door living in peace and harmony. And it was fear that that discord would come to an end and that hope would take root that most terrified the regime in Iran. And so they orchestrated the attack. The Hamas leaders traveled to Tehran, they got funding and weapons from Tehran, and ultimately coordination. I'm sorry, but I refuse to believe that ragtag terrorists in Gaza were able to accumulate all of those weapons and all of that intelligence and coordination on their own. This was an outside job.
Now, why is this important? It's important because it forms our policy as a country towards Tehran. And it's terror arm, the IRGC. The IRGC murdered 55 Canadian citizens and 30 permanent residents by firing an unprovoked missile at a civilian commercial aircraft, PS-752, over three years ago. Let's get this straight. This group operates legally on Canadian territory. It can recruit, coordinate, mobilize, fundraise legally on Canadian soil over three years after they murdered 55 of our citizens. What is our Prime Minister thinking? It's time to ban the IRGC. <laughs> Common sense conservatives will continue to press the government to ban the IRGC, to remove the bureaucracy and streamline the funding for the security infrastructure program so that shuls and all places of worship, including mosques, churches, Hindu temples, can put up the security to protect their people. This should not be... I think it is appalling that a mosque, which was targeted by uh, an, an anti-Muslim violent attack in Mississauga two years later, still does not have funding to protect itself against future attacks. I think it is appalling when I hear synagogues and churches are buried in paperwork for what should be a very simple rebate program that will help all of our places of worship secure themselves with cameras, personnel, and other necessary things that will keep them safe in an increasingly dangerous world. Here at home, we will bring in tougher laws to punish terrorists. We will bring in consecutive rather than concurrent sentences so that those who carry out mass murder will not get bulk discounts for the number of murders they commit. And just as we will keep our streets safe with jail and not bail for repeat violent offenders, and we will secure our borders. We will secure our borders and our ports against the drugs and guns that finance terrorism and that lead to the loss of life here in Canada. We will stand with the Jewish people on campuses fighting anti-Semitism at universities. Common sense conservatives will also defund anti-Semitism. We will go line by line through all the groups that get dollars from the federal government, and we will defund every single one of those that promote anti-Semitism in our country. And then, comes the difficult question of the Middle East. Now, I understand why the political pressures are high, and I understand why our Muslim friends and neighbors are suffering, and are legitimately speaking out for the suffering of their loved ones in Gaza and in the West Bank. There's no doubt that the Palestinian people have been made by the Iranian regime and other dictators in the regime, in the region, into a chess piece, in a, an evil chess game. We know that there are dispossessed fa Palestinian families. Many of them have loved ones here in Canada. My heart goes out to them. I believe that we should ensure that Canadian aid actually goes to the suffering Palestinian people and not 
to those promoting terrorism in UNRWA. When the government, when our government sends money to UNRWA, it takes, it, it, commi it commits to an organization whose members were involved in the attack of October 7th, and it takes money away from legitimate aid to real Palestinians who are suffering in Gaza and in the West Bank. We, as a, as a rule, across the world, common sense conservatives under my leadership will be cutting back foreign aid to terrorist dictators and multinational bureaucracies and using the money to rebuild the Canadian Armed Forces. Thank you. We will continue to stand up for the right of Israel to defend itself. We will do that. And we will reject any motions and resolutions before the United Nations that unfairly target the Jewish state. We believe in a, a negotiated two-state solution with Palestinians living in peace and harmony next to a Jewish state, state where we build prosperity, liberty, and opportunity for both peoples, and where all the Abrahamic peoples have access, unhindered access, to their places of worship. But we say, I want you to know, I say all these things in mosques. I do go to mosques. I love meeting with the Muslim people. They are wonderful people. And when the issue of Israel comes up, I say, I'm going to be honest with you. I am a friend of the state of Israel, and I will be a friend of the state of Israel everywhere I go. We can no longer have the two... Because we can no longer have this business of saying one thing to one group and another completely different thing to a different group. That's what we have. I mean, Justin Trudeau has come up with this political formula, right? He sends one group into synagogues to say one thing, and then he sends another group of MPs into mosques to say precisely the opposite. But here's the thing. Individual MPs don't have a vote at the UN. Individual MPs do not make decision on how foreign aid is distributed. Individual MPs do not have the ability to speak for the entire Canadian government on the world stage because there is only one Canada. So that formula, while it might make for good politics to have one individual MP who says the right thing in order to get a seat back and keep Justin Trudeau in power, does not solve the problem of having Canada take the right and principled position one position, one position for all of Canada, one position around the entire world. So every MP has to decide where they stand, not just what they say. And that stand is ultimately what matters the most. Now, conservatives will stand with you. I know that it's hard right now. Many of you feel alone. You feel scared. You question whether you should take your Masuza off the door, the Star of David off your chest, the kippah off your head. I can't even imagine the thoughts that go through your head when you contemplate such things. No one in Canada should ever have to hide their faith in order to feel safe. I want you to know that you're not alone in these struggles, that you have friends, you have friends. I want you to know that you have friends not just in the Conservative Party, but across all of Canada, 
who will stand with you and will fight for you and work to protect you. And I want you to know, I want you to, to look at the echo of the unmatched history of the eternal Jewish people. I was able to witness that history and that resilience when then Prime Minister Harper assigned me to represent him on the March of the Living. For those who've not been, it is a walk from the first concentration camp, Auschwitz, to the most prolific death camp, Birkenau. Survivors, their loved ones, and supporters lock arms on this long and painful march. I remember being shaken by the images that I saw there, the prosthetic limbs that had been ripped off incoming prisoners and gathered up in a storage room, the sheared hair, the jewelry, the instruments of torture, I remember when I witnessed all of this, how horrible it must have been for the little children who were marched into those horrendous gas chambers. And what struck me most, though, was when we were taken to a brick building, and the guide said to us, this is the building where they kept all the stolen plunder of the incoming prisoners, the jewelry. It was there to, to house all of the treasure. So they named it after a land of great treasure. They actually called it Canada. Because all of those, all of those prisoners and guards had seen those advertisements from the Canadian government those decades before, that there was a land of great treasure. So they named the building after that treasure. And the guards would, in a sick joke, taunt the prisoners by, who had to go and work in sorting in that building by saying, you're going to Canada today. I thought of all the people who died dreaming of coming to Canada. And I, it shook me. I remember breaking down in tears and the ironic sight of Jews comforting me, a Gentile, at Auschwitz-Birkenau. It made me think of how lucky we are to be here and how important it is for us to extend those treasures to the rest of the world by standing up for what's right here, now, and everywhere. But you know what else I saw there? I saw the Jewish young people who were there to honor their grandparents or other lost loved ones. They would put small stones on, behalf, on, on top of big stones. There were no tombstones or other markings, but it was their way of saying, we're still here. We haven't forgotten you. We still love you. And at the front, a cantor sang a beautiful psalmly, Psalm 23, in Hebrew. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you were with me, O Lord. And that gave hope and inspiration to the people there. But most of all, I saw Israeli flags flying in the wind. The Star of David, the symbol of the Jewish people and now its homeland, was like a symbol of triumph. It said, from the faces of those Jewish young people, we are still here. You did not stop us. You are gone and we are still alive. <laughs> Think of the trash can of history, it is filled with those who have tried and failed to destroy the Jewish people. From the Pharaoh, to the Haman, to the totalitarian socialist dictators of Hitler and Stalin, all of them have been defeated. 
And yet the Jewish people still go on. I don't know what the world will bring tomorrow. I don't know much less a hundred years from now. But I do know this, that a thousand years from now, whatever is going on, on Fridays, as the sun goes down, there will be a Shabbat in Israel. Those songs will still be sung. The Jewish people will go on and they will still say, Am Yisrael Chai. Thank you.